Hello! Good morning everybody and welcome to another couple with Casey. So today, as you might be able to tell from my swatch sheet, I'm going to be working with my Copic markers again. Copic, Copic, however you say that. And yeah, it's going to be simple. I've already got the picture. You're just going to sit with me and we're going to colour it all in. So let's head on into my sketchbook. <laughs> Okay, so through many sketches and sketches, I managed to come up with this, which is my D&D character for Lord of the Rings, Dungeons and Dragons that I play with my family. Her name's Astral and she's a pirate. And we just completed the campaign and she has been retired, so I'll never get to play with her again, which is really, really sad. So... That's what I'm doing today, is I'm, I'm drawing up a final, a farewell image of, of Astral. So, let's get to it. We need to pick some colours. Then my wider range of uh, Copic markers for this. So, let's just move that out of the way, because it's making a shadow on the paper. Let's see. Now she's on the sea a lot. So she's fairly tanned. Fairly tanned, I say. And I'm probably going to make her super white just because I'm terrible at picking skin tones. I'll go with these two. And you know what? Let's just, let's just do it section by section or so. Get that out the way. I'm not even going to swatch these before I use them. I never do with my Copics because I've got my swatch page there. The only time I swatch them before I use them is I'm, if I'm testing how well they blend together. But I'm fairly sure I've used these two colours before together. And you know what? I realised I've got the wrong lights on. Give me one second. And hopefully... Yeah, that's, that's much better. I can actually see what I'm doing now. So you might be able to hear some faint classical music in the background. My little girl is in the lounge watching Fantasia. And by watching I mean she's on her playmat with Fantasia playing. Whether or not she's actually watching it or just sleeping and chewing on her hands, I don't know. But it's keeping her quiet, so. So this is Astral. And um, as I said, she's a pirate. She was from a family D&D campaign that we've been, like, we were playing for got to be at least 10 years. So we hadn't touched it in about eight. So um, we were so close to finishing the campaign, it was an epic campaign, so by the end of it the characters were to be discontinued, which is obviously what happened with Astral, but um, we finished it last, not last weekend, but the weekend before, and ah, oh, it was so good, and I'm going to miss this girl so much, she's the reason I have a macaw tattooed on my shoulder, and it's kind of so many memories with with this character in particular when playing D and D with my family. And I have I have another character for another Lord of the Rings because we like Lord of the Rings in my family. So um, we do play regular Dungeons and Dragons as well, and we play some Deadlands and um, and some other types of D and D too. But Lord of the Rings is kind of our go-to play play style, play games, because we all like Lord of the Rings, and yeah, so Astral is a pirate, and she spent her life sailing on the Anduin, which is a big river in Middle-earth, cuts down between Mirkwood and Lorien and a bunch of other 
places and her father used to be the captain of the ship and she um, got the crew to mutiny against him because she wanted to be captain and she didn't think that he was um, he, he was old and she wanted him to give her the job but he wouldn't so she mutinied against him and he ended up getting killed which she didn't plan so she went a little bit crazy and now she has like an imaginary parrot like no one else can see this parrot but she can see the parrot she has to ask the parrot anytime she does any tests so anytime I do a test I have to first consult with Captain which is what she calls this parrot hence come on Captain and um yeah so she has to consult with this this parrot that doesn't exist before she can do anything and it was it was really good fun to role play and I'm really gonna miss this girl and it sucks that she's gone but it means we can start new characters and I mean it's never stopped us from starting new characters we have so many campaigns on the go but um, but yeah it's just oh I miss her already and she's only just gone she's like a part of me uh, our first campaign we used her for we uh, we were in Moria which, if you don't know anything about Lord of the Rings, is a dwarven mine, really big dwarven mine, that um, ends up being taken over by by orcs, and the uh, the dwarves dug too deep and woke the Balrog, and da 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 da. But the, the when we were playing it, it was before that had happened. Oh no, I think it's just after the dwarves after the dwarves aren't there anymore, but before. Barry, that's, that's what we call the Balrog, before he's sort of awakened in a sense, like we never encountered him, if we had, in, oh no, I think actually at the end he did wake up but we were already leaving and it was like, um, as soon as he woke up and we felt his presence we had to make fear checks which are impossible to pass because he's, his fear level is so high and so we all end up fleeing the mines, which we were leaving anyway, thankfully, so... But we, were, we were down there to collect something, I think Gandalf sent us on this mission. I can't remember, but we had to go find something in these mines, and we end up finding it and then leaving, and then... an impossible time skip later... Um... Gandalf again sends us on a mission and we have to go find Gollum and that's the epic quest that um that we that we did we ended up having it we found Dol Guldur and and um we went in there and that's where Gollum was hiding and I think it's set between when the Nazgul have captured Gollum and he's escaped and when Gandalf finds him to find out what he told them about Bilbo with the ring so well, he sent us to go find Gollum so we could find out what he told the Nazgul about Bilbo and the ring and that's that's the epic quest we were doing and it took us eight years to finish or over eight years, as I said, because we hadn't played it in eight years, and um, it was cool. I I tied Gollum up on a on a rope, and we were leading him around. He had to help us escape because the Nazgul showed up, and again they have fear checks which are impossible to beat. So my brother's character, which was this um, dwarf of the Durin line, which I don't know how much you know about. Lord of the Rings again, but the Durin line's like royalty, um, so his, he's like an uncle or a nephew or something, and um, he sacrificed himself so we could escape, and oh, it was so good, it was so much fun. But uh, there's one point in the campaign where we, we got stuck in Mirkwood, so Mirkwood is um, I wouldn't say evil magics, but it's it's not good magics. <laughs> and we went in there 
once and we ended up getting stuck in and that's that. So if you've seen The Hobbit, you know that they the dwarves leave the path and then they get lost and they end up going in like a big circle and um, can't find their way. So that basically happened to us. And thankfully Astral has a looking glass that can see through enchantments. So she used that to find the way out. So we all escaped Mirkwood and then the rest of the team were like well we have to get into Mirkwood because that's where Dol Guldur is so let's just go back in and Astra was like no that's dumb we'll get trapped again we should find another way to Dol Guldur which by the way if, if you've seen a map of Middle Earth there is a clearing path that you can walk through to find Dol Guldur without um, having to go through the trees in a way that's going to get you lost. But no, no, the rest of the, the rest of the, um, the rest of the team went back in and Astra refused to go in and because she was on her own outside, um, an evil chick showed up named the, what was her name? She was the, oh, I cannot remember, crone, a crone. And she, um, she turned Astral into a tree. So, Astral's stuck as a tree. The rest of the party are stuck in Mirkwood again because Astral's not there with her magical looking glass to help them get out. And, um, that's when the DM's like, well, we're not going to be able to go anywhere unless I intervene and add some, I don't know, giant eagles or something that save the day. Like in the movies, how the eagles just show up at the opportune moments. But instead of the eagles we had Radagast so if you've seen The Hobbit Radagast is Radagast the Brown he's one of the one of the wizards he came and found us and helped us get out and well helped the rest of the party escape and then they came out and they were like well where's Astral gone we can't find her she's disappeared she must have left and obviously I'm a tree and so I can see them and can think, but I can't move or do anything. So, um, again, none of them, <laughs> they all fail their sense magic test to see if they can tell that I'm this tree. So Radagast had to be like, oh, wait a minute, your friend is right here and turned me out from being a tree, which then I had to make a test and I failed and now my character Astral is forever scared of trees so if at any point she's in anywhere with trees like a lot of trees she has to roll a will save to see if she's brave enough to not be negatively affected by the trees and um, she, she, she fails that quite often because it's not an easy test to pass and so yeah, she, she's, she's scared of trees, so pretty much in trees she's at like a minus three to all tests. Which if you know Middle Earth, Dogodur, as I said, is in the middle of Mirkwood, which is a forest. So after we go back in to find Dogodur, which we ended up having, I think Radagast took us through the woods so we wouldn't get lost again. I don't actually remember, it was eight years ago. Oh, I've got the sniffles, I do apologise. Sniff! Um, either way, we end up finding Dol Guldur, which is a ruined, uh, well, a ruin, an abandoned ruin in the middle of Mirkwood, which again, I believe is in The Hobbit, that Gandalf, Elrond and Galadriel fight with the Witch King, is it? Oh, I haven't seen The Hobbit in so long. I don't know, they fight with him there, they fight with one of the bad guys there, or possibly all of the bad guys of the, the Nazgul there. But that's that's where we end up going and finding Gollum and having my brother Daniel's character sacrifice himself in the most brave, brave way, which ended up being not so brave, but we never find that out because he shut the door on us and helped and held them off. But what actually happened is as soon as he saw them, he collapsed in fear and passed out. But we never saw that, so we think he was very brave. 
and um, all the tales of him are um, his gallant fight to defend us from the Witch King as we escape through the underground tunnels and yeah. <laughs> It didn't really go that way, but we weren't to know. We, we were locked out. But it was really fun, and I'm really going to miss this character. She is one of the best characters I've ever created, and obviously we've played as these ones so much because we finished two campaigns with them that I actually had, you know, I built up her character a bit and knew, knew her a bit better than my other characters. Like I've I've got another character that is a law master, which is what Elrond is. Basically she she can do magic, but she's mostly just collector of knowledge. Um and she she can turn into a bear. And through the campaigns we've played with her, she's found a magic amulet that allows her to permanently control a wolf. So she has, I believe we just refer to the wolf as Wolfie, she hasn't named it because it's not a pet, it's just like under her control. Um, so she's got this wolf that she can control, but she can turn into a bear at will. And um, her usual choice of bear is a polar bear or a um, brown bear, the other one that's really big, I can't remember. I don't live anywhere that has bears native animals, so I ne never had to learn really about all the different types of bears. But she, she usually goes for a polar bear just because they're big and nasty and a little bit different. And um, it takes her 60 seconds to transform, so if she hasn't transformed preemptively for when combat commences, it takes her 10 rounds of combat to turn into a bear, which I don't know how many of you play D&D, but combat doesn't usually last for 10 rounds if you are competent at what you're doing. So I have to, a lot of the time, guess when we're going to be going into combat to be able to turn into a bear with enough time to join in the fight, otherwise I'm half a bear and half a human. Or well, actually I believe she's an elf, half elf. Um, and not, not able to do much. I just, all my turns are spent in mid-transformation, um, passing my turns, so. But if I don't manage to turn into a bear, she's also, she can shoot, like, lightning out of her hands and stuff, so that's pretty cool too. And it's a pretty boss spell in the Lord of the Rings D&D &D world, so. Especially if you roll double sixes on your um, stamina check and you get get extra damage dice for it because it can because there's no way it can miss once you've passed your stamina check the spell can't miss so um, as long as you pass that you've definitely hit them with lightning and lightning hurts quite a bit I think it's like 2d6 worth of damage or something that armor doesn't mitigate so yeah it's, it's good I miss playing as her her name's Varian by the way I don't know if I've said that yet but I like her she's fun to play as I, I don't know what we're gonna be playing next we're starting to play D&D &D monthly again as a family so actually I might put some down here so I don't know if we're gonna be going with more Lord of the Rings, or if we're going to delve into one of our normal D&D campaigns. Like, I have quite a few different... We have quite a few campaigns, and one of them I'm a gnome that has, like, 20 names, and any time she introduces herself, she has to say every single one of them. Because that's what... Like, gnomes have lots of names in D&D. They, they collect names. Every person they meet has a different name for them, basically. Like their family has one name for them and their friends have another name for them and and they earn names as they do things. So she has like she's like tis feather flower pop fizz bang so on so forth and her her like at the end with only one twoop. And anytime I introduce her I have to read the whole list of names out 
and she's earned some new names since since playing the game as well so <laughs> it just keeps growing and growing and growing and then yeah it's fun I really enjoy it and I'm glad we're gonna be playing monthly again but I am really gonna miss Astral she is she's my my baby well not my baby but you, you, you know what I mean so I didn't really think her colour scheme out at all before starting this. I just knew that she had blue eyes and brown hair and also I forgot she has face markings. I don't know if they're tattoos or just paint but I need to do the blush on her cheeks first so we'll do that. Where is the... I used that one didn't I? Blush, 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 blush. Blushy on the nose. Blushy on the cheeks, blushy, blushy, blushy. And then I might not use that one, that's a bit dark. I'll use this one to spread it out. Blend, blend, my pretty blend. So I'll talk about the art a little bit <laughs> whilst, whilst I'm here instead of just talking all about Dungeons and Dragons and Lord of the Rings. Um, as you can see, I'm using similar shades of the same colour to shade for this, which is different than how I use on my Procreate videos. I just use a purple layer of shading over that, which you can do with Copic markers. Um, you have the ability to do it. You've got all the different greys, and if you find the right shade of purple, which a good one I find is... Where is it? I think it's... BB31, that's the one I usually use if I'm going to shade that way with Copics. Um, but I don't do it very often because I like how saturated it looks when you use different shades of the same colour to, to shade <laughs> with these because there's just so many colours and I am lucky enough that I have so many of them. Why wouldn't I use them for shading, you know? And I've been using my Copics for years, like, oh goodness me. I think I was in high school when I got my first set. My parents got me a set of 36, is it? I think it's 36 for Christmas one year because my parents are awesome. I wouldn't say I'm like an expert at Copic markers. I, there's definitely some things that I can't do with them. Like my fiance can do really, really awesome portrait work with these. And his shading skills are like incredible. But he is also a tattoo artist of many, many years. So I think his ability to do portraits from that definitely helps him. But gosh. Some of his work is insane. And I must remember not to compare myself to him because our art style is very different. But I do I do like how I use Copic markers. I always enjoy it. Um, and I haven't done it in so long, which is why the past couple videos of me and my book are using them, because I love them. And Vegemite, hello. <sighs> yes, buddy. I love you too. Say hello to the camera. Say hello everybody. I am Vegemite. Now you need to go out of here buddy. Gosh you can tell I don't use these as much as I used to because they're covered in dust. <laughs> I have them in like a plastic stand and you can tell which ones I don't use as much because they are covered in dust as I said. So I'm doing this bit a bit different than I normally would as you've probably seen most of the other parts I coloured with the dark shade first and then went over with the light shade to blend it out. This one, this bit I'm just doing straight with one colour. There's no real reason for that. <laughs> just in case you were going to ask. It's just because, because I can. And I'm a little bit lazy. I don't, I don't know how I want to shade the bag yet. So I can always sell shade over the top 
afterwards. Uh, do I want the sword sheath to be a fancy colour? I think I do. I'm going to leave that. And then we'll use the same dark brown for the boots, which I will shade. So I need a darker shade of brown than the one I'm using. Which... I'm thinking that one, though it's not quite as red. It's kind of like a greeny brown. Maybe that one, because it's more red. I'll go with that one. E77. This one. So, like I said before, go in with the the darker shade first. Ooh, is this running out? Don't run out on me. You can tell when they're starting to run out because the nib gets really sort of flexible almost. It's hard to explain the nib. It feels different when it's starting to run out of ink. It makes it less easy to control. And I hate it. <laughs> if this one's nice and juicy, I can control this really well. Cause I think it's because I'm not having to press as hard or something. Who knows? If any of you do know, let me know in the comments below. But it's just... I hate it when they're, when they're starting to run out of ink. I obviously use E77 quite a lot, or it came with my very first set. Which I don't know because I, don't have, I do have the box, but it's not. I used to keep them all in their original boxes, and then I just had like a special Copic folder for the spares that I bought as just singular colours. Um... But it was just, any time I wanted to use them, I had to have like three boxes scattered around and then the folder, which I knew where every color was in them, but it was just tedious. And now I've got my nice shelving unit over there, which has them all in there. It's just, it's so much neater and it looks so nice on my desk as well. So that's why I did that. So this scimitar as well, she got from the elves. <laughs> Like she, she has an elvish scimitar which um, does extra damage to orcs because, I don't know, I, I found it <laughs> in Moria. I don't know why there was an elvish scimitar in Moria, but yeah, that's where I found it. And this is going to be the perfect time to tell you I have no idea what colour I want to do the coat. I mean... It would look good in red, but I feel like I've put too much red on there to make it red now. If you know what I mean, like, I've got the, I should have done that sash in teal and that in teal as well. Because now if I do the... Uh, what have you done, Casey? Why? You know, I'm going to do it. It's going to be red. I don't care if there's too much red on this picture. So I'm avoiding using any black. Obviously the lines are in black, which I use my Sakura Microns because I'm obsessed with them at the moment, but I feel like it would have been better if I used my Ohuhu fine liners to do some coloured lines instead, just because the amount of brown I've used in this piece, I think if I'd used a brown liner would look really effective but again you live and you learn next time I'll probably forget again to do it so I don't know if you can see what I'm doing but I'm going through the areas that oh for goodness sake that I would normally be doing with the darker shade as the shading I'm going on those areas first with using this really dark brown and I'm being slow on those areas to give that section of the paper just a little bit more ink and then going over the the rest really quickly so it's really it's almost transparent so you can see the the areas that I did first to make them a little bit darker so it almost shades it with itself 
And it only, I mean, it works with all Copic markers because Copic markers are very good at layering. But I find it's really good to do it with the darker colours because you can't really shade very well with the darker colours because, you know, they're, they're quite dark and they... Because there's, you know, once you've once you've reached your darkest colour in one shade, that that's your darkest colour, you can't get darker than that. And there's only so much layering you can do until it's reached the epitome of dark and then you can't shade anymore. So I like to try and get that shading done first almost, so take a little bit extra time to slowly place down the shadows and then colour over it rather quickly with the same colour and it, it can give you this really nice sort of shaded effect. It works really good on fabric, for fabric I find, because it's just subtle enough to look like folds. That's usually how I do pants as well, like jeans and stuff. I will do that sort of effect just because I find it makes it look more more like the folds of the, the fabric. And I'll come back in with the slightly darker one to shade it up. Because no one wears white white in Lord of the Rings except for um, Saruman and, and then later on Gandalf and I think Galadriel as well. But they're magic so they can keep it clean and you know Galadriel's royalty so I'm sure she has someone who cleans her clothes for her. But okay and then these bits down here as well, make them grungy. Grungy pirate lady is grungy. She doesn't keep her whites nice and fresh. No oxy, vanish oxy action for this lady. Okay, that's looking pretty cool if I do say so myself. Blend, my pretty blend. Yeah, there's not enough ink left in this pen to blend properly. That's okay. And there we go. So now we'll just go through with our white gel pen. Add some much needed highlights. There we go. Super shiny, super happy. Looking good. We'll put some little highlights on the hair maybe. And there we go. Get the Vegemite hairs off my page, which somehow appeared out of nowhere. And we have a completed drawing of Astral. And final touch. Every good artist should do sign my work. And there we go. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and we will see each other next week for another couple with Casey. And I need a fresh one because this one's gone cold. Hope you enjoyed it, guys. See ya. Bye.